So we're in Luke 7, starting at verse 36. And the, the, the title of this, if you have this, says, A sinful woman forgiven. A sinful woman forgiven. One of the Pharisees asked, I'm in the ESV, the English Standard Version, one of the Pharisees asked him, meaning Jesus, to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining, Jesus, at the table, in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? <coughs> Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has not ceased to stop kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who was forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. So today, I want to call this a bold move. You have to take a bold move to get what you need. So, as I was studying and me and Pastor were, you know, praying about what God may have us to preach and teach about, like I said, in this season, worship came up. And I said, okay, what, what, what is it, God? What do you want us to, to talk about? What do you want us to really understand about worship? Because most times when you hear worship, you're thinking about singing. Like you hear, you worship, you know, praise and worship, right? Usually praise and worship goes with song selections. You really don't think about your heart posture in what you do and how you come, all right? Praise and worship is a segment in a Sunday morning community fellowship to give God praise, to sing songs unto him, to honor him, uh, for us to come together as one body and we worship God together through song. But there's also other ways of worship. This is just a little bit of worship, but true worship we're going to look at what true worship looks like because in order to really worship and have true worship, it comes from a place inside of you. It's a mindset. It's not necessarily what you say or do, but it's a mindset that you have. It's a posture of your heart of who you feel 
deserves worthiness. Amen? So this woman hears about Jesus being in the house of a Pharisee. All right? We know the title of it is A Sinful Woman Being Forgiven. So we know that this is a, a, a woman that has sinned. A woman with a reputation not to be godly, but to be ungodly. All right? So she's a woman that is a sinner. She's a woman with a reputation. She's a woman that would not be invited into the house of a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the leaders. They were the, the religious people. They were the scribes. They were the ones that taught the Bible, the five books of the Bible. They called the Torah. They knew it. They studied it. They lived it. They, they taught in the tabernacles. They lived it up and down. They followed the law. They were super duper religious. And the religious means you practice something over and over again, right? I can religiously get up every morning, do my makeup, which I don't. I'm not that kind of person. You're going to get it here and there. Um, but you know some people religiously get up and have to have a coffee. 630. Have to. Religiously. Right? We all do things or have practices that are religious. So the Pharisees were very religious people. Jesus has come on the scene, and the Pharisees are really not liking this Jesus man. They're really not feeling him. Okay, you claim that you are the son of the God that I serve, but you're doing some stuff different. Okay? Jesus is on the scene. He's doing stuff on the Sabbath, which the Sabbath means the day of rest. So according to the Pharisees and Seals of Jews today, they don't drive cars. If you've ever seen the, the Jewish community, like on Saturday, they walk everywhere. They don't use any kind of electronics. That's the day of rest, so I'm not supposed to work. You're not supposed to do anything. So this Pharisee invites Jesus into the house. His name is Simon. The young lady gets wind that he... Jesus is in Simon's house. So she comes uninvited. Has anybody ever been in a situation? Let's take a lunchroom. And everybody has their table, right? You got the, 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 the jocks over here. You got the basketball team. You got the cheerleaders. You might be new to the school, so you don't know anybody. So you are feeling unwelcomed and uninvited. How hard is it to walk up to a table not knowing anyone or walk in a room or an area where you know that you are not welcome? Okay? That's why this is called you have to sometimes make a what? Bold move. You have to make a bold move. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sure she already had knew or heard or seen what Jesus could so because she heard that he was near her, her boldness, no matter who she was or what she did or not even being invited, allowed her to get past all that and still move forward to getting to Jesus. So what I want to say to you this morning, sometimes you may feel uninvited, sometimes you may feel unwanted, but you don't need an invitation when Jesus is in the room. You don't need an invitation when you know that Jesus is present. You don't have to get permission from anybody because your permission is given from God. Amen? Amen. So sometimes you may find yourself in arenas, whether it be job, whether it be school, whether it be a club that you want to get into, but you may be worried because of the people that are around you may not look like you, may not talk like you, may be up. Look at you funny, maybe snickering and you're talking crazy. You may even have a past that many know about. But when Jesus is there, you don't worry about what nobody else has to say. You can't let your past determine your future. You can't let what you've done and what people know about you stop you from moving forward in meeting Jesus. Amen. Yeah, you can stop that and yourself. Amen? Amen? Because she was determined. The title of it is a, a sinner woman. This is a woman that has a reputation. Come on. You can use your imagination. I don't know exactly if she was a thief, a liar, if she was a prostitute. It don't say what she was. But they knew her. And how hard is that to enter into place 
places where people knew you, they know you, right? They know what you've done. And you like, oh man, do I really wanna go up in here and be faking with these folks? Do I, do I really wanna put that fake smile on right now? Because I really don't wanna do that. And sometimes when you, even let's be honest, sometimes for, I've been in church for a long time, and you know people, and you make mistakes. Because guess what? We all fall short. None of us are perfect. And you got to walk back in there and face something. And some people you walk back in, you face that may have hurt you. Or you have hurt them. Right? And sometimes when you're in these kind of positions and situations, it's hard for you to even focus on God. Because you're so worried about what somebody's saying or thinking you. Oh, you're so worried about how they got the nerve to worship God and they ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh. Right? I've been there. I, I've been the Pharisee. We're going to keep going. I've been in a position when I felt like, oh, wait a minute now. How are they going to have a nerve to walk up in here and ah, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Wait a minute now. Won't they just ooh, 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 ooh? And I'm forgetting that, guess what? Just because I didn't do that doesn't mean that I'm without sin. Yeah. Just because that's not my issue doesn't mean that I don't have issues. Amen. So, at, at, oh, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So, she, she hears, and, and that, that, that word hears really stuck out to me because the Bible tells us that, that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God, right? So once she heard that Jesus was near, her faith activated, and she began to move. And as she's moving, as she's entering to this, this home that she's not invited to, she comes in, Jesus and them are at a table. I wish I had a table. So they're, they're reclined at the table, so the table's kind of low, and they're kind of all sitting around where they can look at each other. And the woman comes up from behind. She comes from the back. So Jesus doesn't even see her coming in. She comes from behind. And she comes with her alabaster box or the flask of oil. She's coming to anoint him. And as she's coming to anoint him, she gets so overwhelmed at being in his presence. I've been in the presence of God where I couldn't even talk. You, you, you just begin to cry out and pour out, and there's no other feeling like that in the world. When you are in the presence of God, and you just begin to cry out and release to him. And she's crying out, and she's releasing unto him. And I just picture her covered up because back then, the women, they were covered up. And I picture this woman full of sin, coming into a place of righteous people, of high people, noble people, like being in the room of governors and presidents and priests. And here comes this woman, the sinner, the one that's wrong, the one that everybody talks about, the one that has a reputation. And she comes up behind Jesus with the flask of oil, and she begins to weep. And she begins to posture herself down on her knees. And this right here is a place of humility. When we begin to humble ourselves and come down on our knees, we are saying that we are not worthy, but you, God, are worthy. I humble myself to you, God. Because I honor you in your presence. So she's crying tears and tears and tears and tears. So many tears are flowing that she takes her hair down and she begins to wash his feet off with her tears. And the Bible also tells us in Revelation that God will bow all your tears, every tear that you ever cry, all the pain and the hurt that you may have endured in your life. He bowed every tear. He knows the hurt and the pain that you've been through. He knows the scars that you've endured. He knows the abuse. 
abuse that you have been through. He was always there. He will bottle your tears. He will never forget you. And now I know she knows everybody's looking at her like, what is she doing? But she doesn't care about what nobody has to say. She knows that she's in the presence of God. And when you know that you are in the presence of God, God is saying this morning, I don't care about what you've done. I don't care about who's around. When you are with me, this is the audience of you and me. You block everyone out the room. And you get down and you worship me like you've lost your mind. You be bold and take a bold move and do whatever you need to do to get in the place of worship. Do whatever you need to do to get in that place to be with me. Do whatever you need to do to get what you need. And she's worshiping and she's praying and she's crying and she's wiping the tears with her hair. And she wipes the tears with her hair and then she takes the oil and she begins to anoint his feet with oil. And what she's doing is she's, she's and I'll get more into this Tuesday while I'm teaching, she was anointing his body because in a few days he was about to be crucified. The Jewish custom was when you buried someone, you anointed their body for the burial. But he knew that they weren't going to do that because he was being killed as a criminal. He knew that they were saying he was a criminal when he never yet sinned. And he took on our sin. So God prepared this woman full of sin to come and anoint him for the burial that he deserved. God will take and use whoever he wants to use. We are not God. We will look at somebody and never ever be able to forgive somebody or allow them to be a new creature in Christ. God wants us to know this morning that we are not the judge. We can't put anyone in and out of relationship with God. That is God's call. And while this woman is on her knees crying her heart out, pouring her heart out at the feet of Jesus, the Pharisee is looking at her and he's saying in his mind, this man can't be a prophet because the prophet would have knew that this woman was full of sin and he wouldn't even allow her to touch him. And Jesus never says anything directly. Watch how what Jesus says and how he speaks. Indirectly, he says, Simon, Now, Simon says it in his mind. But whenever you're in the presence of God, God hears your mind. He hears your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. Even when you're praying, you don't have to speak audibly because God already knows what's in us. So this high and mighty righteous man that's supposed to know the Bible, that's supposed to know forgiveness and practice it, is judging this sinful woman for doing what he should have did. Mm. <laughs> Jesus simply uses a parable and says, Simon, let me, let me say something. Let me say something. There were two men that owed money. One of them $50, one of them $500. Neither one of them could pay the debt. What is God saying? None of us could pay the debt of sin. None of us could pay the debt of sin. He said, so neither one of them can pay it. So the debtor paid them both in full. Thank you, Jesus. 
When Jesus got up on that cross and said it is finished, he paid all of our debts in full. We do not have to try to work for our salvation. Hear me. You do not have to try because we could never do it on our own. We could never do it on our own. God paid it all because he knew we would never be able to do it. So because he paid it all, I posture myself like this woman that came in with the oil, that came into his presence with her tears and wiped his with her hair because and she brought the flask of oil she brought the most expensive oil to him she got the most expensive thing in her home the oil that she brought was worth a year's wage of what you earn okay so get that in your mind. What you earn in a year is how costly this oil was that she brought, all right? And she broke that box and she began to let the oil pour on his feet. So now they're saying, wait a minute, couldn't we have used this money to take care of the poor? Because around this time, when we were celebrating the Sabbath, there was a day that they would go out and they would take care of the poor. So now his, his disciples are like, wait a minute now. She done wasted all this good oil on his feet? I said, ain't that like us? Boy, we know we're going to take something and be thinking, wait a minute, I could have done so much better with this. I'm over here wasting this and wasting that. But God was saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You never waste when you give to God. You never waste when you pour out your heart to God. God does exceeding and abundantly above all that we can ask or think. So even though this was a year's wage that she poured out, Don't know where it came from. Friday, I finally went. 
going to urgent care because I'm like, it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And so they were like, well, it looks like you may have a pinched nerve. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, I mean, it, it, something, y'all, if anybody knows me, something always be going on. I said, okay, here, here goes Satan. Can I tempt you in the day, God? Can I mess with your servant today? Let me, let me do this, let me do that. It's, uh, I said, well, I don't know what it is because guess what? I'm not going to stop praising God. I'm not going to stop worshiping God. You can keep messing with me, and I'm going to keep messing with you back every time I come and lift up my hands and raise God in my car, in my shower, in my kitchen. Whenever I get a chance to give God praise, I'm going to get pinched nerve and all. I'm going to give God what he deserves. The enemy will come and try to stop us with all kinds of stuff. I could have let this discourage me. It said, God, you know I'm your child. Why are you allowing this to happen? I could have let this depress me. It said, why does it always seem like there's always something going on with me? Oh, come on, God, I know you can put up your super shield to protect me. <laughs> but guess what? When we're making bold moves, we're showing God that nothing is going to stop me from turning Amen. you. Amen. Nothing is going to stop me from praising you. Nothing is going to stop me from doing what you called me to do. Because I'm not the only one that got to make bold moves. Right? God is calling us to go higher in him. God is calling us to a higher place of worship. And it doesn't matter what. This woman came into this place and she never said a word. She never said a word, y'all. She just postured herself in a place of humility at his feet. I encourage you all to take time out to posture yourselves at a place of worship at his feet. Just lay at his feet. Let out all your pain. Let out all the things you don't understand. And say, God, I still trust you. I will still serve you. I will put you first. I seek you you first because I know that you will make a way out of no way. So if there's anybody today that wants to have a better worship, I just ask you to stand.